All right, well, good morning once again. Can I have you all turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 18? If you're new with us, welcome. It's good to see you this morning. We are working our way through the Gospel of John on Sunday morning. As I just said, we have entered into chapter 18, which focuses on the morning of Jesus' arrest uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then the two trials he would be put through before being crucified. The first being a religious trial, the second being a civil trial. The first trial would be before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish High Council, and the second one before Pilate, the Roman governor of the region. Now, we've already looked at the religious trial of Jesus uh, that morning, and now we want to continue looking at the civil trial that he endured before Pilate. So let's just pick it up in verse 28. Kind of get a running start at today's study. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would have not delivered him up to you. And then Pilate said to them, Well, you take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which was spoken, which he spoke, signifying by which death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation has, and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Pilate's question to Jesus when he asked him if he was a king, and Jesus told him, I'm going to paraphrase, I am a king, but not the kind of king that conquers earthly cities and kingdoms, at least not at his first coming. I am a king that conquers hearts and minds by bearing witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. To which Pilate responds, what is truth? And walks away. Now, commentators have debated for centuries whether this was the response of a broken, despondent man who had given up all hope of ever knowing what truth is, or... Was it the response of a hardened politician, a truly cynical person, who didn't care about knowing what truth is, if he even believed it existed at all? Now, I'll leave it up to you to grapple with that, come up with your own conclusions as to the nature of Pilate's response, what is truth. But as I said to end last week's message and serve as a segue into today's, without truth, life would be impossible. And even though Pilate may have asked this question in a cynical and dismissive way, the question itself is profound, and its meaning essential to human life. So let's look at it. Let's look at it. What is truth? Well, many scholars, academics, and philosophers over the centuries have relegated the concept of truth to the realm of the abstract or the theoretical. And because so many secular intellectuals reject the concept of truth as an absolute reality, in other words, something that is real, tangible, and knowable, 
they conclude it's merely a subjective concept, something based on, a personal, based on personal feelings and or personal experiences. And so they claim truth is an absolute, it's relative. In other words, basically, truth is whatever you want it to be. Because, let me just say this, as I just said, without truth, people can't live. Societies break down. And life would be impossible without, listen, objective, absolute truth. Because without objective, absolute truth, there could be no righteous standard of morality, and therefore no righteous laws governing a society, both of which are based on the objective, absolute standard of right and wrong that we call truth. In our culture today, many have abandoned the idea of moral absolutes in favor of moral relativism. You hear things like, my truth is my truth, and your truth is your truth. <laughs> hey, hey, if it works for you and feels good, that's fine, because that's your truth. And because so many want to do whatever seems right in their own eyes without anyone opposing or judging them, well, naturally, um, they don't want anyone, excuse me, they don't want to oppose or judge um, anyone else. I mean, look, people don't want you to judge them for how they want to live. So naturally, they can't judge you, right? They have to go along with whatever you want to do. Uh, they naturally don't want to oppose or judge the way uh, you're living your life because then it comes right back on them, judgment. And therefore, the mindset today is, I'll accept me, and you know, I'll accept you, I should say, and you accept me. And that is the basic um, mindset of our day, right? Everyone wants to live in a judge-free zone. Isn't there a major uh, exercise company? That's their motto. Our, our gyms are a judgment-free zone. We don't care who you are. You're a guy, you want to go in the women's dressing room, we don't care. We're a judgment-free zone. Again, you accept me, I'll accept you. And so we hear a lot today, guys, in our society about tolerance, don't we? Inclusiveness, love, which the world defines as basically accepting whatever people want to do and how they want to live. And if anyone does speak out against immorality and sin, well, they're immediately labeled judgmental and bigoted, self-righteous and narrow-minded, all based on the belief, and this is very prevalent today, it's a religion, basically, it's an ideology, all based on their belief that there is no such thing as sin. But you see, John the Apostle said in his first epistle, chapter 1, verse 8, that those who say we have no sin are deceiving themselves, and the truth is not in them. And then he goes on in verse 10 to say of those who won't receive forgiveness from God because they are deceiving themselves, they don't think they need forgiveness because they haven't done anything wrong in their minds, at least. He goes on to say in verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, Whereas the first group in verse 8 could be saying that they no longer sin. In other words, after they have now been saved. That's a doctrine called Christian perfectionism. This second group of people John is alluding to, uh, it seems uh, that these folks are saying that they have never sinned at all. You might be thinking, how is it possible that anyone could believe that they have never sinned ever at all? It's possible, listen, if they change the rules or the standards by which certain behaviors are called sin in the first place. And so in our culture today, many have abandoned the idea of moral absolutes in favor of moral relativism. They believe that there are no moral absolutes, no absolute standards of right and wrong. My truth is my truth. How dare you question my truth, right? And they have relegated truth to the arena of opinion. It is now opinion which people have elevated to absolute truth. If I believe it's true, it's true. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Of course, we all know moral absolutes come from God. The Bible calls 
him the supreme lawgiver and righteous judge of all the earth. So those who want to get rid of God's laws have to get rid of God himself. Hence the rise of neo-atheism in our culture, especially among young people. Now once they get rid of God, in other words, once they embrace the belief that he doesn't exist, well, then neither do his commandments exist, which causes them to say, I have not sinned because sin doesn't exist. You see, if there's no absolute standard of right and wrong, then sin is impossible because, listen, sin is a violation of God's laws, which don't exist if he doesn't exist. Again, these people don't believe there is such a thing as sin. And they would tell you and have told me, and no doubt have told you, I don't sin. That's your truth, not my truth. When I have sex outside of marriage or lie uh, on my um, resume or to get that promotion or engage in homosexual activity or kill babies in the womb, that's not a sin. That's just my truth. As they like to say, I'm living out my authentic personhood. Well, then let me just say this to you. If that way of thinking is true, then Hitler was not a murderous monster. He was just living according to his truth. Right? I don't know if they really have gone down the trail where that thinking leads. There, there is no truth. Whatever you want to do is your truth. All right, well, when a guy breaks into your house and steals all your stuff and you call the police, what's the police going to say? He's going to say, or she's going to say, sorry, I can't arrest anybody because they were only acting out their authentic personhood. That was their truth. And their truth is that your stuff belongs to them. I can't do anything about it. It's ridiculous, right? Absolutely ridiculous. This philosophy, guys, has brought us to a period in our nation's history not unlike the period that the nation of Israel entered into under the judges. Read the book of Judges. That was one of the blackest periods in Israel's history. Summed up the words, this phrase was repeated five, six, seven times, sprinkled throughout the book. There was no king in Israel, no sovereign ruler or judge. There was no king in Israel, therefore, uh, therefore everyone did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. That is a nation built on moral relativism. And guys, when a nation moves from moral absolutes, God's commandments, to moral relativism, doing whatever feels right to each person, that nation is ripe for God's judgment, which, in fact, often is already in process because God's judgment, whether people realize it or not, uh, with that kind of thinking and that kind of moral insanity, the judgment comes initially when that society begins to break down. You turn your back on God, he'll turn his back on you. This works for individuals, it works for nations. Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. We're seeing this happening right before our very eyes. We as a nation have turned our backs on God's law. Oh, we give it lip service. But we completely have rejected it as a nation. We are involved in every wicked thing God has condemned. I went through, back, through some of my back messages I was looking for a couple of quotes by our founding fathers that I thought was appropriate at this point. And I found them. The first one is from Robert Winthrop, who was a founding father and an early speaker of the House of Representatives. He made a famous uh, statement that you all probably have heard. He said, and I quote, Men in a word must necessarily be controlled either by a power from within or by a power from without. Uh, either by the word of God or by the strong arm of man, government, either by the Bible or by the bayonet. And then James Madison, the chief architect of our Constitution, said, and I quote, We have staked the whole future of American civilization not on the power of government. I wish this current administration would lead, read a little more from one of our founding fathers. 
But we haven't staked the whole future of American civilization. We haven't staked it on the power of government. Far from it. We have staked the future of all of our political institutions upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God, end quote. This is in contrast. This is how we started as a nation. And the devil has worked overtime in the last couple of years trying to vilify our founding fathers. These were brilliant men. They were not perfect men. They were very upright men. Uh, I read some more that 53 out of the 55 uh, men that signed the Constitution were evangelical Christians. And so in contrast to all this moral, relativistic insanity that we're living with today, stands the word of God which is true and righteous. Let me read to you Psalm 19 verses 8 and 9. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord, the statutes, commandments, it's all the word of God. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. It's hard not to because this is such a subject that it weaves together. And so it's hard to kind of isolate each point uh, that it's linear. It's kind of like a spaghetti dinner. Everything is kind of mixed together. That's okay. Somebody wrote a book, Men Are Waffles and Women Are Spaghetti. What is that all about? I had a pastor bring that up at a conference one time. Men are waffles because they think in little boxes. Everything is separate individual. Women like spaghetti. They can think on a level that we can't even guys comprehend. I mean, they got everything. They're, they're talking. They're thinking about 15 different things all mixed together. And I have to keep things, uh, you know, kind of isolated, right? Yeah. All right. Anyways. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go back to our original, uh, original um, question. What is truth? What is truth? And I thought to myself, well, what would be a good place to start defining truth? Let's go to the secular intellectuals. Scholars, right? Good place to start would be turn to the dictionary. So I went to Merriam Webster's dictionary, right? Classic dictionary, right? Written by, I guess, really smart people. Smarter than me, no doubt. And I wanted to see what good old Merriam Webster's team had to say about truth. What is it? I give you five definitions that were rolled into this one. First of all, what is truth? It's the body of real things, events, and facts. But who decides what is real? Secularists? Atheists? Who don't believe in God? Don't believe in the supernatural? Don't believe in eternal judgment? Don't believe in life everlasting in heaven through Christ? They're going to define what's real? Number two, what is truth? The property is of a statement of being in accord with fact or reality. But guys, who determines what is fact or reality? Number three, truth is the body of true statements and propositions. Oh, I get it. Like COVID came from a wet market in Wuhan, China, right? Uh, getting the vaccine will keep you from getting COVID. And, President, and Donald Trump colluded with Russia and stole the 2016 election. Those were all statements propagated as truth for two years. And they're still being propagated in some circles, right? What is truth number four? Is It's fidelity to an original or to a standard. Yes, but what original and what standard? Rules for radicals? Mein Kampf? What are we talking about? I'll give you one more. That's all I can handle. What is truth? It's sincerity in action, character, and utterance. Really. If someone is sincere when they speak lies, or if they're sincere in their actions, no matter how evil and murderous, like, we'll say, Hitler, or the 9-11 terrorists, 
Well, because they're sincere, right, in what they say, even if it's lies, in what they do, even though it's evil, it's truth, according to Webster's. I mean, after all, the Bible says God counts sincerity for righteousness, doesn't it? No, it says he counts truth for righteousness. Look, Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, to a woman. But in the end, there is the way of death. Just because you're sincere doesn't mean you can't be sincerely wrong. And I think a lot of folks are going to go to hell who are completely sincere in what they believed. It's just that God doesn't count sincerity for righteousness. He counts truth for righteousness. First of all, did you notice how they use truth to define it? These are the big shots. The intellectuals, the scholars. Also, if those definitions seem a little ambiguous and unsatisfactory in our quest to understand truth, it's because, listen, those definitions leave out the source of truth that makes knowing and understanding truth possible, and that is God. Guys, trying to understand truth without God is like trying to understand sunlight without the sun. Truth emanates from God the way sunlight emanates from the sun. And just as trying to understand sunlight would be impossible without focusing on the sun as its source, so too understanding truth is impossible without starting with and focusing upon God, who is its source. Truth doesn't exist apart from God, guys, as an independent or standalone reality any more, once again, than sunlight, sunlight exists as an independent, uh, independent reality apart from the sun. God is truth, which means that what God calls truth is an expression and an extension of himself. It is something that, um, that emanates from him as part of his divine nature. Even as Jesus said, who of course is God, he said, I am the way, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. I want to read you something Pastor John MacArthur wrote on the subject of truth. I thought this was really good. And he said, and I quote, he said, Ask anyone today what is truth, and you're sure to start an interesting conversation. Well, that is true. Try it on a university campus, and you're likely to receive laughter, scorn, and derision. The concept of truth has clearly fallen on hard times, and the consequences of rejecting it are ravaging human society. So let's go back to the starting point and answer the question, what is truth? One of the most profound and eternally significant questions in the Bible was posed by an unbeliever called Pontius Pilate. Pilate, the man who handed Jesus over to be crucified, uh, turned to Jesus in his final hour and asked, what is truth? It was a rhetorical question, a cynical response to what Jesus had just revealed. I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. 2,000 years later, the whole world breathes Pilate's cynicism. Some say that truth is a power play, a meta narrative constructed by the elite for the purpose of controlling the ignorant masses. To some, truth is subjective. In other words, the individual uh, world of, of uh, preference and opinion. Others believe truth is a collective judgment. In other words, the product of cultural consensus. And still others flatly deny the concept of truth altogether. So what is truth? MacArthur says, here's a simple definition drawn from what the Bible teaches. Truth is that which is consistent with the mind, the will, the character, the glory, and the being of God. Even more to the point, truth is the self-expression of God. That is the biblical meaning of truth. Because the definition of truth flows from God, truth is first of all theological. Truth is also though ontological, which is a fancy way of saying that it is the way things really are. Reality is what it is because God declared it so and made it so. Therefore, God is the author, source, determiner, governor, arbiter, ultimate standard, and final judge of all truth. He goes on to say, in fact, the most valuable lesson humanity ought to have learned from philosophy 
is that it is, imp it is impossible to make sense of truth without, without acknowledging God as the necessary starting point. Truth is not subjective. It is not a consensual cultural construct. And it is not an, in an invalid, outdated, irrelevant concept. Truth is, first of all, the self-expression of God. On that level, truth is thus theological. But again, it's also ontological uh, in the sense that it is, re it is reality. Uh, God is created and defined and over which he rules. But truth is also, and this is most important, moral. It's a moral issue for every human being. MacArthur concludes, how each person responds to, tru to the truth God has revealed is an issue of eternal significance. To reject and re rebel against the truth of God results in darkness, folly, sin, judgment, and the never-ending wrath of God. To accept and submit to the truth of God is to see clearly, to know with certainty, and to find life eternally, end quote. I think Pastor John nailed it. That's a great, uh, great um, definition of what truth is from a biblical perspective. But I want to kind of build a little bit on that because... Even though Pastor John did a great um, job at defining truth biblically, I still want to uh, kind of piggyback onto some of those thoughts. Um, let me just say this. I believe that people today really want to know what truth is, but they're just as confused as Pilate was 2,000 years ago. And because of it, many have come to the conclusion that, first of all, truth doesn't exist, Secondly, it's totally subjective. In other words, truth is whatever each individual person believes uh, it to be. And number three, that it's hopelessly unknowable. But again, we have Jesus, the master of all, to give clarity here, who said, I have come to bear witness of the truth. And by saying that, Jesus was telling us that truth is real and it is knowable. Earlier in the evening, the Lord define truth for us right john 17 verse 17 when he prayed to his father at one point he said father your word is truth as we said earlier truth is essential for life and jesus told us that god's word the bible is truth guys many people are are frantically looking for truth and um, they're looking everywhere and yet it's right there in front of them. They don't or won't come to the Bible for the answers on how to live their lives. That's sad to me. That's sad to me. My mom spent many years searching for truth. Any of you who knew my mom knew she wasn't a weirdo, but she was a seeker. And she looked for truth everywhere. Um, hypnosis, handwriting analysis, astrology, uh, seances. Until finally one day, God laid on her heart that truth was right there in front of her. We were raised Roman Catholics. We knew the Bible, or at least we knew of the Bible. And my mom said it wasn't until she picked up the Bible and began to read the Word of God, the lights came on. It made sense. I get it. Now I know what truth is. Truth is God and His Word. But many people who understand the Bible claims to be the word of God refuse to come to it. They don't even read it. They, they won't even touch it. They won't look to it for the answers on how to live their lives. One author said it well. He said, and I quote, The Bible is the truth about life and death, time and eternity, heaven and hell, right and wrong, men and women, old people and young people, it is the truth about children. It is the truth about society. It is the truth about every relationship between God and man, between man and man, and between man and creation. It is the truth about everything that really matters, end quote. In the King, New King James Version of the Bible, the word truth occurs 237 times. And basically has two meanings in Scripture. Let me just say this, as I said the first service. There's a lot of things that might be true, and people have asked me, is all truth God's truth? Well, if it's really true, yeah, it's of God in the sense that, you know, it really is looking at reality in the proper light. 
Uh, I'm not saying because something is true, um, it's good. I mean, you can have, you know, it's true that I baked the cake yesterday. It's not good. <laughs> so we live in a world where there's a lot of things that are true that just don't matter, okay? Um, it's true uh, that I like pizza, but who cares? That's not going to affect your eternity. So the Bible focuses on truth and the Bible is talking about eternal truth. Truth that will affect your eternity. And when the Bible speaks of truth, it is usually referring to uh, two concepts. First of all, the temporal facts man may observe about himself in the physical universe, including, including the truthful reporting of the facts. And number two, eternal and spiritual reality pertaining to God and the relationship of the creation to him. Now, guys, when the Bible speaks of truth, it usually re is referring to the latter of those two meanings. Spiritual truth pertaining to the character and actions of God and that which deals with our relationship to God. Let me give you a little sampling from both the Old and New Testament. 237 passages. No, I'm not going to go there. Uh, I could, and you know I, I do sometimes. But I'm just going to give you a little taste of what the Bible says, Old and New Testament, on the subject of truth. First, and I, you won't have eternities, it's just too many. Just write down the references, all right? First of all, Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Speaking of God, it says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all His ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice. Righteousness and upright is He. Now, folks, this is one of many verses that we could pull out and uh, we could set before somebody and say, this verse forms the foundation for life. If you don't have this as the founding principle, the founding truth for your life, your life will never be what God wants it to be. It will never be fruitful. If you don't make God the foundation, the one who was the rock, right? And so on. Psalm 31, verse 5, into your hand... God, I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. That is the goal of life. First one, the foundation of life. This one, the goal of life, that you get saved, that you be redeemed. That's God's whole goal in working in this world to redeem those who are fallen. The whole world is full of fallen people, but God so loved the world that he gave his son, that he came to die for Sinners that we might be redeemed, saved. Psalm 33, verse 4, the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. Psalm 119, verse 160, the entirety of your word, not just some of it, the entirety of your word and, uh, is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. I'll give you one more out of the Old Testament. Psalm 57, verse 10, For your mercy reaches unto the heavens, and your truth unto the clouds. Now in the New Testament, again, just a little sampling. With regard to truth, we read John 1, 17, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Again, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 17, 17, Father, sanctify my disciples by your word, your truth. Your word is truth. And one we just touched on this morning, John 18, verse 37, Pilate said, Are you a king then? To which Jesus responds, For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Guys, it is crystal clear. You know this. That God's word says to us that the truth in God's word will either save us if we embrace it, believe in it, or it will condemn us. It will judge us someday on the day of judgment. Psalm 96, verse 13. For he is coming, the great king and judge of all the earth, Jesus. For he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Romans 2, verse 8. 
talks about those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, Jesus, when he comes, will bring upon them indignation and wrath, judgment. Romans 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, women, who suppress the truth in their desire to live unrighteously. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. This, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men, all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of of the truth. That's our God. He doesn't want to send anyone to hell. He doesn't want to judge anybody. He sent his son to die that we would not have to spend eternity in hell. Because he has given us his truth, the gospel. Guys, the word of God brings life to unbelievers and victory to believers in this battle that we are involved in with the devil. And because of it, listen, the devil has declared war on the word of God. The word of God will bring life to unbelievers and victory to believers. And therefore the devil has declared war on the word of God. You say, when? Well, way back in the Garden of Eden, the devil declared war on God's word when he first tried to get Eve to doubt what God said. Remember this in chapter 3, Genesis 3, verse 1. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The Hebrew in this verse could be translated, so God has said, has he? As Satan subtly sows doubt into Eve's mind as to what God actually said. One author put it well, he said, and I quote, here we have the first question in the Bible posing the first dilemma in human history. There were no dilemmas before this one. The question is carefully crafted by Satan to start Eve down the path of doubting God's word. He knows that doubting the word of God will inevitably lead to rejecting the will of God and then doing whatever seems right in her own eyes. And so, for the first time in human history, the most deadly spiritual force was covertly smuggled into the world. What was it? The assumption that what God has said is subject to human judgment, end quote. That's relativism, which we are living with right now. It's not new today. Nothing new under the sun, Solomon tells us. But today, what is new is that the attacks have become far more blatant and in your face. As Satan seems to have thrown off, I guess, you know, all subtly, and now has adopted a direct frontal assault when a, a direct frontal assault approach in his attacks on the Word of God. The attacks of the enemy, as we know, against the Word of God are happening on a number of different fronts, not the least of which is the attack we are currently seeing in our culture, the attack on human sexuality. As I said to close last week's message, the human race cannot exist without truth which doesn't simply have, guys, moral implications. It also has physical implications as well. During the COVID pandemic, people on the left were always shouting, follow the science. We believe the science, right? And yet these same people have rejected the most basic science with regard to the human race, the science of male and female genetics. Human genetics are not a matter of conjecture or subjective belief. They are a matter of basic science. Genetically speaking, boys, and boys are born with, uh, X, with an X and a Y sex chromosome, while girls are born with two X sex chromosomes. This is science in its most basic form. Deny it. And you not only deny science, you destroy the foundation of civilization itself. Psalm 11, verse 3, the psalmist says, If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And the foundation of humanity is that God made them male and female. That was the starting point that God opened his word in Genesis chapter 1. That God made mankind male and female. 
And God doesn't make mistakes. He didn't make somebody a male who was really supposed to be a female. Now she's got a transitioner. He's got a transition, and vice versa. Guys, gender confusion, as they're calling it, is, a, is an attack on God and his word. Make no mistake about it. Again, Genesis 1, verse 27, Genesis 5, verse 2. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. He created them, male and female, and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And yet we have leaders that tell us there aren't two genders. God says there are two genders. Man comes along now, much smarter than God, apparently. And I checked online how many genders there are now. We get a variety of opinions. I saw 50-some, 75. Somebody said 150. We have leaders that are spouting this garbage. Somebody just told me that the governor of Illinois, J.B. Pritzker, went on TV and said recently, biology is meaningless. Now, I'm sure the, the governor didn't realize that when he, made, when he made that statement that he was acting as a mouth, mouthpiece for the devil who wants to destroy the basics, right? If the foundations are destroyed, the devil has been attacking the foundations of society Yes, human genetics, but the Bible. The governor, I guess, didn't realize that he was a, acting as a mouthpiece for the devil. Maybe somebody should have shouted from the audience, get thee behind me, Satan. Oh, that would have been rude. More rude than a man taking the word of God and twisting it and corrupting it to suit his politics or to score political points. Look, we are living, I want to wrap it up, we are living in a world of lies. Lies have always been around. Ever since the Garden of Eden, Satan introduced lies into the human race. But it's escalated, hasn't it? And we have so-called experts everywhere spouting off things that they claim are true, but they're complete lies. So how do we know what is truth? Well, very simply, and we've already talked about it. I defer to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ who said in John 8 verses 31 and 2 if you abide in my word you are truly my disciples and you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free free from man's lies some of these lies are sincerely held by people who think it's the truth but if it doesn't line up with the word of God on the matters of light that really matter it's lies let all men be called liars, but God be true. I don't care what the experts say. If they contradict what God says, whether they know it or not, they're liars. Turn to 2 Peter 3. We'll bring it to a close. Second Peter 3. Let's pick it up in verse 16. Yes, Peter wrote this epistle, but right here he's commenting on the writings of Paul the Apostle. 2 Peter 3, verse 16. He talks about Paul, who in all of his epistles, speaking in them of things in which some things are hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away by the error of the wicked. Peter is saying, look, I know Paul's writings can be a little difficult to understand at times. He's a brilliant guy. But don't give up on knowing what the scriptures teach. Lest you be led away by people who don't even know what they're talking about that spout off some nonsense like they're big experts. You remember the verse that says about false teachers, they speak great swelling words of emptiness. You ever read some of these unbelievers, these intellectuals' columns? 
Boy, they use a lot of fancy words, don't they? Their whole thing is sprinkled with fancy words. Look at how erudite I am. Look at how I'm a, I'm a scholar. And you look at that and you go, I don't even know what this guy's saying. Or this gal. This doesn't make any sense. This is a great swelling words of emptiness. We're living in those days. Beloved, you know this, Peter said, that the devil attacks the word of God. And he sows lies into the world. He's the father of lies, John 8, 44, Jesus said. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, clinging to the Bible as your foundation for life, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in grace and in the knowledge, through the word, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. I'll give you one more quote. We'll close. One author said, and I quote, Scripture is God's truth. Whether it affects anybody or, uh, whether it affects anybody or nobody, it is God's truth whether you agree with it or disagree with it, like it or don't like it. The truth is offensive, and there will always be a fixed animosity between the culture and, and authentic Christianity. The divide or chasm between the two could not be any wider than it currently is today, end quote. Because we're living in the last days. And now more than ever, the devil wants to neutralize the power of God's word by undermining it and making people think it's untrustworthy. He knows there is, it's the power to give salvation and victory. He knows that. Unfortunately, he has neutralized a lot of Christians' walks because they have bought into lies by so-called, I don't know, philosophers and, you know, intellectuals that the Bible can't be trusted, full of errors, um, and so on. So in conclusion, what is truth? Very simply... God is truth, who has expressed himself in the pages of Scripture, his holy word. God's word is truth. Believe it, and you'll be saved and live a blessed life. Reject it, and you'll be condemned and live a life eternally apart from God. What did Pilate do with the truth when it was presented to him? That's interesting. Let's look at that next time. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to give us a voracious hunger for your word, that we might know it in these last days like we've never known it, that we might cling to it like we would a life preserver in the midst of an open ocean sea, that, Lord, you would give us a heart to know it, to study it, uh, grace to understand it, and the power to apply it into our lives every single day of our lives. We thank you, Lord. We ask you to keep, to continue blessing these studies in your word. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.